My name is Andile, as I've already been introduced. First of all, let me thank Two Guide and the G20 Young Entrepreneurs Alliance for the invite. And a special thank you to my fellow Africans and the South African delegation that is here. As the chairman has already indicated, it wasn't a long time ago that the picture of Africa, the continent I live and that lives in my blood every day as most Africans was seen as a hopeless continent. Everywhere you read about Africa, it was a destination of foreign aid, no conversation about investment. It was a basket case that was ravaged by war, intolerance, terrorism, and poverty. In recent times, even the economists had to swallow their own pride and publish the cover they did in December 2011, where the Africa Rising conversation started. And, and it was clear that perceptions were changing of seeing Africa not only as a place you send food and aid to, but actually an attractive investment destination. One of our sponsors this particular week is EY. They also happen to be our group auditors back home. And they issue and publish something they call the Africa Attractiveness Survey every single year. I would encourage you to get in touch with them and uh, make sure you go through it every year that they do because you're an entrepreneur and you're looking for opportunities. One of the things that comes out of the survey is the reasons why a lot of business people are quoting as their own barriers into investment in Africa. And you will see that nearly 55% refer to political instability as the reason why they don't invest in Africa. 12 elections were held on our continent last year. Seven of them resulted in a change of leadership. And by change of leadership, I mean a different political party won. The, the one that grabbed all the headlines was what happened earlier this year in Nigeria, the biggest country on the continent and now also the biggest economy. There was a change in leadership. Everybody was holding their breath of what would Africa show. And Africa showed that democracy is alive and well. The research also showed that there was a big difference between the views or perceptions of those people who have already invested in Africa. A lot of them were very bullish about the, the returns that they thought they could get. And they were overwhelmingly pos positive. But many people, some in this room, who had never been invested in Africa, perhaps only been there on holiday, had a dim view of Africa. And the Western countries of Europe and the United States, and Asia, of course, as a developing conglomerate, I guess, um, have tended to take prominence in that conversation and not Africa. I'm here to tell you that you are missing a golden opportunity. And I'm going to show you how. In the research, they found that last year, the number of capital projects dropped in Africa. But look at the value of those projects and look at the jobs that they tend to create. We outnumbered every single country and region there in terms of the growth rate of the impact. 136% growth just in FDI value in one year, 68% year-on-year growth in terms of staff and people. Ethiopia, Kenya, Tanzania, Mozambique, Zambia, Cote d'Ivoire, among 22 economies in sub-Saharan Africa that are all going to grow by more than 5% this year. So I too would agree with what the research showed, that Africa and its leaders have reached an inflection point, a point where deliberate and urgent action has clearly happened. That's why you can have the cover of The Economist in just over 10 years being so vastly different. But what are these trends? What are the trends that are affecting some of this growth? I'll have you know it's not commodities. So if you see Africa as a place for oil, because you read about Nigeria and Angola, which are very oil rich, or you read about South Africa and other countries about copper and gold and platinum, we are not only about resources, which are obviously not enjoying a good time in the markets lately. The trends that are actually driving this growth are coming from industries like real estate, hospitality, and construction. A lot of consumer-facing sectors as well, technology, media and telecommunications, and consumer and retail products and financial services. So we are like any other economy in the world. We have established banking systems, we have rules of law, we have security of tenure and property rights, 
in a vast majority of African countries are indeed respected. I'll give you a small anecdote about Netflix that I'm pretty sure everybody knows. In South Africa, which is still the most advanced economy in Africa, Netflix has announced that they're coming into the country in 2016. Every single broadcaster in my country is now working on or has already launched a product to try and retain market share when Netflix comes into the market. That kind of tells you the kind of pace upon which these economies can change and try and, and keep that, that, that uh, market share. But it also shows you that there's still room for foreign investment. And I'm pretty sure that Netflix is going to bring um, the kind of, of disturbance and the kind of, of disruption that the markets are looking for. So I've given you a sense of why Africa is an investment case and not a basket case. Hopefully, I've also given you some tips on some industries you should be thinking about. But let's turn our attention to entrepreneurship. On social media, they love the hashtag, the situation right now. According to the Small Enterprise Development Agency, total entrepreneurship activity for South African small enterprises of less than 42 months was 9.1% in 2013. This is a measure, essentially, of how entrepreneurial we are. So, Loosely translated, 9.1% of the population of South Africa want to start businesses and there's activities there. But this is only for businesses that are less than three and a half years old. For entities over 42 months, that same index goes down to 2.9%. And what does it show? It shows that certainly in South Africa, and I'm pretty sure in most other parts of our continent, there's a high fatality rate of new small businesses. So we've created excitement about starting businesses, we've created excitement about people's liberation psychologically that they can build their own futures and start their own companies and businesses. Unfortunately, three and a half years later, more than half of these businesses are no more. Why is that? This is a study that was done by the Omadir Network in 2013, and it shows the main sources of financing for entrepreneurs in sub-Saharan Africa. When 45% of funding comes from personal or family loans, and you're talking about a continent that comes from the economic profile that Africa comes from, you can only imagine what this might mean. Only the haves have the opportunities to sustain businesses. So the first thing that we really lack that could change the game for us in terms of entrepreneurship activity is access to what I like to call patient capital. Most of the capital in a lot of the projects that I quoted earlier from the EY study come from private equity firms bank debt that's looking to fund infrastructure projects, the really big ones. But you and I as entrepreneurs who like to start with ideas and build them and scale them, there's not enough capital for that. And the only capital that these entrepreneurs are finding is from their family and friends, which was touched on earlier this morning. But if you're an African child and your family and friends don't have the means to even take you to university, let alone give you a loan for us to start a business, you can imagine what that does to economic activity. You can imagine what that does to sustaining businesses as they go through a growth phase. That's number one. Number two, mentorship. Joan yesterday spoke quite passionately about how when she was in a big corporate, there was support. There were mentors because she was part of the IBMs and the big companies. And we see that as well in Africa, where the big companies are there, there's all sorts of transformation and all sorts of mentorship programs. There's no corporate called entrepreneurship. So you have a lot of these guys pretty much on their own, and it becomes a very lonely journey. What would really change the game is to find a solution that connects business people from around the world that can help a lot of these entrepreneurs, but in a way that is scalable. If I had to choose one thing with my involvement in entrepreneurship in South Africa, if there's one thing we could fix that could change things, is to find a way we could mentor entrepreneurs on the continent in a scalable fashion. Many people have tried. I'm yet to find something that's actually worked and has changed the game. And lastly, this is a cartoon from a very popular cartoonist in South Africa. His name is Zapiro. Um, Broad-based black economic empowerment is a program by government in South Africa, post-apartheid, which was implemented to make sure that the majority of South Africans that were left out of the economy participate. It has largely been successful, except one thing. It's created what South Africans call fat cats. Those will be the two guys that are standing there at the bottom. And it has left out the majority of South Africans, and those are the people who are demonstrating on the left with jobs and poverty um, um, as, as a banner. And the caption is saying, this isn't how we envisaged broad-based economic empowerment.
And this is a story of many economies that have grown out of colonization into democracy, um, and they're struggling with this divide and the inequality between the haves and the have-nots. And governments, unfortunately, see entrepreneurship as something that's for everyone. My favorite example is football, as I close. I'm a big fan of football, and I know Europe is also a continent that loves its football. Just like in football, anyone can be an entrepreneur, but entrepreneurship is not for everyone. Cristiano Ronaldo was born to a cook and a gardener. Probably at that stage, you never would have thought to be the best player in the world. So you needed systems in the game of football that can find a Cristiano Ronaldo. And now he's one of the most valuable players in the world. But there's only so many Cristiano Ronaldos. So I certainly would like to see governments shift how they support entrepreneurship towards a broad-based, narrow, but very shallow in terms of impact strategy to a more narrow one that goes deep and finds the Cristiano Ronaldos of entrepreneurship in Africa. I come from a country with 11 official languages. These are just some of them for me to say thank you so much for lending me your ear.